During World War II, Agatha Christie was afraid she might not survive, so she wrote two novels to be published after her death. One novel starred Hercule Poirot. The other featured Miss Marple. After the war, the two novels remained locked away until the 1970s. The last ever Christie novel to be published was the Miss Marple story, Sleeping Murder. Now, I already gave my thoughts about this book's TV adaptations in an earlier video, so to get a fresh perspective, I've brought in a guest. I'm joined by my sister, Susanna, an avid reader of thriller novels. Thanks for being here. Yeah, they never hold a candle to Agatha, unfortunately, so pleasure to be here. Although it came out in 1976, Sleeping Murder takes place in the 1940s, between the Marple novels The Moving Finger and A Murder is Announced. It's had several film and TV adaptations, but we're going to focus on the ones starring Joan Hickson and Geraldine McEwan from 1987 and 2006, respectively. The story begins with Gwenda Reed, a young blonde newlywed arriving in England for the first time in her life or so she thinks, and going house hunting for the home she will share with the man of her dreams. As a young blonde newlywed who just bought a home with the man of her dreams, I'm uniquely qualified to comment on this story. Gwenda finds a house that instantly feels like home, but she soon discovers during her renovations that the changes she's requesting resemble the home's original design. We're talking everything from finding an extra door to the kitchen that had been plastered over to describing a room's original wallpaper in perfect detail. This is only vaguely troubling to Gwenda until she starts having flashbacks in which she sees a body at the bottom of the stairs. The body belongs to a beautiful woman she instantly recalls is named Helen, even though she's never met a Helen. At first, she thinks she's going crazy, or worse, becoming psychic. But then, during a trip to London, she meets Miss Marple, who helps her realize that the reason she knows the house so well is that she lived in that house as a small child. During that brief period, Miss Marple theorizes, Gwenda must have witnessed a murder. The part of this story I've always found the most compelling is how haunting Gwenda's flashbacks are. Imagine coming to a place you think is entirely foreign to you and finding that you just know things about it that you shouldn't. The wallpaper moment is the most intense, I think. Firstly, because she describes it down to the type and color of each flower in the paper's pattern, and then sees exactly what she described magically appear right before her eyes. But also because it's a style of nursery wallpaper so common that you might find it anywhere. In fact, it's pretty similar to my own childhood bedroom wallpaper. The Hickson adaptation was pretty faithful to the story. It was, perhaps to a fault. It seemed like the producers were so concerned with sticking to the book that they forgot to apply any sort of movie-making artistry to convey feelings or mood in a scene. I'm talking about using things like different kinds of shots, dynamic lighting, natural sound effects, and music. Instead, it relied on music so jarringly overdramatic that you can't help but laugh, as well as a ton of lazy memory voiceovers to force emotion into the scene. Well, the McEwen version sets things up a little differently. Gwenda, played by Sophia Miles, is engaged, not married, and she house hunts with the assistance of a man named Hugh Hornbeam. In the book, Gwenda meets Miss Marple during a night out at the theater with some friends. During the performance of a play called The Duchess of Malfoy, Gwenda hears a line that terrifies her so much she screams. She's heard it before, spoken by Helen's killer as he strangled her. In the film, Hugh is worried about Gwenda, so he calls in Miss Marple, and then they go to the theater. It's the same play, but they skip the important line. I actually like that they took out Gwenda screaming in the McEwen version. Even in the book, it felt a bit extra. I liked that the newer version included flashbacks. Yeah, that was a huge missed opportunity in the Hickson version. Flashbacks help engage audiences by putting faces to names and giving you a sense of who the character is beyond the simple facts about them. In the Hickson version, Helen, whose death is supposed to be a tragedy, is essentially faceless. The audience has very little connection to her, yet is expected to care about her and finding her killer. 
In the book, Miss Marple advises Gwenda to let sleeping murder lie, knowing from experience how dangerous investigating a murder can be. But, excited by the puzzle and frustrated by a lack of answers, Gwenda and her husband Giles naively decide to try and solve the murder anyway. They soon discover that Helen is actually Helen Kennedy, Gwenda's stepmother, who was briefly married to Gwenda's late father, Kelvin Halliday. Helen's older half-brother, a stiff, practical Scottish gentleman named Dr. James Kennedy, explains that Helen ran off almost 20 years ago. He says he hasn't seen or heard from her since, aside from a vague letter she sent soon after her disappearance, saying she ran off with a new lover. Kennedy also shares something shocking with Gwenda. Right after Helen ran away, Gwenda's father suffered a mental breakdown and had a delusion that he'd killed Helen. He later committed suicide, seemingly out of guilt, while living at a sanatorium he checked himself into. Gwenda becomes afraid that her father might have been the murderer, but Miss Marple, who's aiding Gwenda and Giles in their investigation, points out that her father's story, told through Dr. Kennedy, doesn't match up with what Gwenda remembers. Additionally, the doctor who treated Kelvin at the sanatorium tells Gwenda he doesn't think Kelvin was insane or a killer. One part of the book I liked was a kind of Easter egg. When Gwenda's visiting the sanatorium where Kelvin died, there's an old lady who says to her, Excuse me. It wasn't your poor child. What's interesting is that although that book had come out just a few years before Sleeping Murder, it wasn't written until three decades later. Creepy. In the book, Gwenda and Giles look into the men in Helen's life, quote-unquote, and find three likely suspects. Jackie Affleck, one of Helen's many admirers, Walter Fain, who was briefly engaged to Helen until she broke it off, and Richard Erskine, a married man with whom Helen had a short but intense romance. Richard's wife, Janet, is a very jealous woman and is also a suspect. The Hickson version continues to follow the book, but in the McEwen version, we find out that Helen was part of a troupe of vaudeville entertainers, which includes Jackie Affleck, Richard and Janet Erskine, and a new character named Evie Ballantyne. All of them are remembered to have behaved strangely on the night Helen disappeared, but their book motives have been done away with. Richard never had a romance with Helen, and Walter was never engaged to her. He was just an admirer. In all versions of the story, midway through her investigation, Gwenda makes contact with Lily Kimball, a woman who worked at the Halliday household as a maid when Helen and Kelvin were together. She always suspected that Helen hadn't run away, but had instead been murdered. Before Lily can give Gwenda any pertinent information, she is strangled and killed, confirming that the murderer is still alive, knows about the investigation, and is still trying to cover their tracks. Even though a lot of story elements in the McEwen version are true to the book, like Lily's murder, we lose so much of Gwenda's character development, replaced by all these other subplots among the theater troupe. I didn't mind the change to a theater troupe, as extra as that choice was. I think the characters are more interesting overall. The problem is, even though it's more engaging, it makes needless changes to the story that take away from the message Agatha was trying to convey, which I'll get to later. What did you think of the Gwenda Hornbeam romance? I thought it was a little cheesy and forced, but I didn't hate it. In the book, Miss Marple puts together that, based on Gwenda's memories of the changes that were made to the house, Helen is likely buried under the terrace. They call the police, and of course, Miss Marple is right. Coming to the conclusion that Gwenda now knows too much, Dr. Kennedy comes into her house when she's alone and repeats the words from the Duchess of Malfi, revealing that he's the murderer. The big clue is that the character in the play who says the line is a brother who kills his sister, but only 1940s British theater buffs would know that. Thanks, Agatha. But really, the more accessible clue that Agatha drops for the reader is in how Lily is killed. Dr. Kennedy is the one who arranges for her to meet with them. He's the only person other than Miss Marple, Gwenda, and Giles who even knew she was coming. So he's the only person who could possibly have had the knowledge and opportunity necessary to kill her, assuming she was killed because she was going to reveal information about the murderer. 
Kennedy also had an unhealthy, possessive love for his sister. When he found out she and Kelvin were going to move away, he murdered her rather than let her live a life apart from him and his influence. Even though the Hickson movie keeps more to the book, in the end, it feels a bit flat. Though I do like that they have Miss Marple spray Dr. Kennedy in the face to save Gwenda. Yeah, I missed that in the other film. The McEwen version's climax is less original and a lot more complicated. They change it such that Gwenda's mother and Helen turn out to be the same person. The backstory is thin and convoluted, and Dr. Kennedy's motive has this whole sexual aspect to it that comes out of nowhere. And the thing is, the book is largely about misogyny. Not just the misogyny of Helen's brother trying to control her and feeling entitled to her, but also the misogyny of covering up her death by making her out to be boy crazy and quote-unquote loose. The newer film turns her from a woman trying to escape a toxic relationship into a fugitive who's not all that sympathetic. So basically, both films had some good points, but both of them could have been a lot better. Yeah, agreed. Anything else you want to say before we wrap up? Just that I love the line. It's very dangerous to believe people. I haven't for years. It's also funny that they talked about that room in Gwenda's house being a nursery because of the bars on the windows. In my experience, bars are put on windows to stop robbers when you live on the first floor of a city apartment building. Could be a nursery. (laughs) Well, thanks again for joining me. Thank you. This is fun. Everyone else, thanks for watching. Next time, we're going back to Poirot with the murder on the links. I'll see you then.